This is Somewhere in the Skies with Ryan Sprague. Hey guys, Ryan Sprague here from Somewhere in the Skies, and welcome to a special live episode of the show tonight. Uh, if those of you who are not aware of Expedition Bigfoot, what are you doing? Go over to Discovery Plus right now and check it out. They just had their season finale last night, and uh, the chatter online was, um, it blew a lot of people away. And um, you guys know me, I'm all about everything, UFOs, Bigfoot, uh, Loch Ness Monster. I'm moving to Scotland just so I can hunt Nessie. So um, I thought what better than to bring on the guy who's been out on these expeditions with Expedition Bigfoot for the past three seasons of the show. And will there be a fourth? We will talk about that. Um, but before we do that, I do want to welcome everyone in the live chat here. I see Darcy, Skinwalker Ranch Dressing, Bigfoot Society is here, uh, Wise Guy 4. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for being here. We are going to take some listener questions, maybe throughout, maybe at the end. We'll see. Um, this guy is a busy guy, so we'll see what we can do tonight, guys. So I guess without further ado, Let's bring him in to talk all about season three of Expedition Bigfoot, the finale, and all the amazing discoveries they made this season. So, welcome back to the show, Mr. Bryce Johnson. What's up, man? Hey, Ryan. How's it going? Good. Very good. So, I, I have to show you this before we do anything. Um, oh, I yeah. I got this just for you, brother. <laughs> <laughs> we are celebrating. Nice. Today. Oh, that's <laughs> great. As as my Bigfoot Collectors Club listeners know, I, I don't drink, but I'm a connoisseur of, of non-alcoholic drinks. So I've prepared my own little uh, something to go along with the show. But it's great Good. to be here. I'm a big fan of Somewhere in the Skies. So hello to all your listeners. And uh, thanks for having me back on, man. My pleasure, my pleasure. Yeah, I think we had you and Ronnie on to talk about season one when the first when the show first yeah. premiered. Um, so it's yeah, been a little right. while, and uh, oh man, you guys have had a lot of incredible stuff happen uh, since. Yeah, then. yeah, I would say season season three or or last year was was probably the most active we've experienced uh, ever since the show began. I know. Um, at least personally, and I know the other teammates would feel this way. This was by far and above the most active uh, expedition so far. It has been. And, you know, we're going to go over, I think, tonight some of the um, the evidence that you guys collected. Because, you know, Great. like a lot of these, these shows out there, these investigative shows, um, there's just a lot of very, you know, what was that? Back from commercial? Nothing. Mm. And um, it's just... I think people are kind of tired of it. They're sick of it, you know, being dragged along season after season. But the one thing that Expedition Bigfoot has done from the very start is say, you know, if we don't find evidence, we're not we're not going to do this. And you guys, you you've just you've pulled out all the stops. And I think three seasons in um, you've gone further than most shows would ever, ever try to do with this sort of stuff. You know, when it when it comes to like technology that you're using to try to uncover Bigfoot um, and the scientists you speak to, the government people, uh, it's just incredible. Um, so I guess, I guess kind of to start, could you tell us a little about the team for those of us, um, for those of the people in the audience who don't know about Expedition Bigfoot, let's give them kind of the crash course on who's on sure. your expedition team, how this all came about and yeah, give us the origin story if you don't mind. Yeah, no, absolutely. Well, the, the whole, I mean, the whole premise was from the get go is, um, you know, we're at a, we're at a time and place where we have some of the most cutting edge technology and it's, and it's improving and um, every, every day. So, you know, we just wanted to bring some of that technology to bear on what I call the Bigfoot phenomenon and see if we could sort of crack this egg a little bit, or at least move the ball forward. Um, so it was always about using um, the, the most cutting edge, latest technology equipped with an algorithm where we could dump in all kinds of material like, you know, everything from moon phases to date and times of sightings, reportings, what type of reportings did something, did they see something, did they hear something, you know, so all that fed in. 
um, which would spit out a hot spot where we could go and bring a team of researchers and actual scientists uh, with sort of a boots on the ground mentality, keeping one foot always grounded in science. And, and yeah, so, you know, Bigfoot evidence in the past, as you spoke on a little bit, has always come with a little bit of controversy. And so, you know, we just want to make sure that we dot our T's, uh, I mean, dot our I's, cross our T's and, uh, you know, do a great job using accredited labs and, and, and getting that evidence analyzed. And, and man, I got to tell you, you know, in the, in the three years we've been doing this, the, some of the experts I've been able to speak to has just, it's been an, an incredible experience and it's really expanded my perspective and opinion on, on what the Bigfoot phenomenon is. Right. And I mean, we all know uh, that, you know, you had an interest in Bigfoot before the show came about. It wasn't just like it fell in your lap. Like you'd been working your ass off for years uh, looking into this cryptid. I mean, you were in a Bigfoot movie. You have a Bigfoot themed podcast. So um, <laughs> yeah. I guess how how does it feel, you know, finally being vindicated finally being like this this is something that true science can look at and um there's something to it not only that but people are letting you go out in the field and actually like know. do this it's, on their dying it's, crazy. it's like it's crazy it's yeah. crazy and you know what i gotta i gotta i gotta admit you know if you would have asked me 10 15 years ago what i would have been doing and and you would have told me i would have been you know looking for bigfoot on a on a travel channel show i probably would have laughed <laughs> in your face but you know the universe is funny when you have a passion it moves things towards that passion to make it a reality. And, you know, I know I, you know, to answer your previous question, uh, just to sort of give the the team intros a, a, a real quick mm -hmm. shot, just to let you know who's on the show. I mean, we have, you know, one of the greatest primatologists around. Her name is Dr. Maria Mayer, and she's a Fulbright scholar. She co-discovered the world's smallest primate uh, in Madagascar, and she's a legitimate anthropologist primatologist and she's incredible she's incredibly courageous and brave and you know they call her the female indiana jones but she just kicks ass and then russell acord who is a uh former military sergeant in the army and he has an extensive career uh do, doing that and hunting and survival skills he's been hunting all of his life tracking so i mean not only that but he's he's been researching bigfoot as well for the better part of two decades so I mean, it's Russell that gets out there where no one else wants to go and gets <laughs> always gets those most incredible videos because, you know, and, and to his point, like he always says, I want to go where people don't and Bigfoot does, you know, and that's why I think mm -hmm. he's always struck with a lot of those great opportunities to film these creatures in their environment. And Ronnie LeBlanc, right. of course, right. as we know, I mean, here's a guy who is really a, an all-around paranormal researcher, I'd like to say, with a special interest in Bigfoot, um, you know, helped for, cast some of the first trackways that came out of Lemster Park down there on the East Coast. And uh, so he's been involved in Bigfoot and, and the paranormal for, um, for quite a long time. And so we often have great conversations about um, what this creature is, what's taking place out here. And, you know, and Murray and I'll have great conversations about the legitimacy of of eyewitness reports and the science behind it. And mm -hmm. Russell, man, you just point and tell him where to go <laughs> and he and he could go anywhere and get a job done. So it's a great team. And, you know, I just I, I'm just there to facilitate uh, using contacts that I have and, you know, being able to reach out to technology companies and defense contractors and you know, I, I speak with a lot of the witnesses and uh, try and put together a game plan to, you know, bring about the most success. Yeah. Well, and I think that's what you guys do so well is you have people out in the field and you're kind of at the command center, making sure everything's going according to plan. And one of the things I really liked about this season, and you have done this in the past as well, is, you know, if they find some sort of noise out there in the field, record it, they can shoot it to you. You can clean that thing up, send it back. It's like how it again, like this is not what we've seen in expeditions like this before or or even investigative shows like yet you guys have the technology to finally try to uncover this mystery. And it seems like, you know, you're getting closer and closer every step of the way. It's just and we're going to go over a lot of that evidence, Bryce. But um, 
Yeah, yeah, I'm excited. I do want to say we have um, Bigfoot Society here saying the creation yes. of the skull. We'll get to that. Yeah, yeah, that definitely a fan, definitely a fan. Bigfoot Society, um, coolest thing they've done in a long time. I have to agree. Um, Tate here says hello, Bryce. We got a lot of expedition fans. Oh, here that's tonight. great, man! Shout out to Tate. Shout out to Bigfoot Society. Love those guys, man. That's great. They're awesome. Um, well, let's talk about evidence, Bryce. Now, um, sure. this expedition this season actually brought us to two different areas, um, which I do want to talk to you about, like why that happened. Um, well, why don't we start there first, actually? You know, we started in one place at the beginning of the season and ended up in another. And this kind of had to do with something that you you came across. So would you mind telling our audience a little about what brought you from Washington to California? Sure. Well, the season, the, the season really starts in, in Washington, which I think, you know, uh, out of all the states in the United States gets more Bigfoot sightings uh, per capita than anywhere else. So, you know, the first half of the show focuses our search uh, on that Olympic Peninsula. And then, of course, uh, halfway through, you know, um, we want to, you know, change gears and go right to the uh, epicenter of where the whole sort of Bigfoot phenomenon got started. And that's in Northern California. And I guess in the back of my mind, I always knew we wanted to go there because, I mean, I always wanted to look at that Patterson Gimlin film site one more time. And we were able to do that uh, mm -hmm. in this in this year, which was a really a real highlight for me. And I'd love to Love to talk about that a little bit more later on. But um, yeah, so we made the move to California. And look, we're always trying to follow uh, a lead, whether it's uh, whether it's a, a hair that's telling us maybe we should go here or, uh, or a recent eyewitness report. Um, so, you know, we're always trying to keep an open mind. But that being said, it's it's a it's a real logistical challenge to up and and, and switch gears like that. But I think it paid off, man. <laughs> yeah yeah it definitely did it, again it's amazing like the two types of evidence you were finding in both places which obviously begs the question you know we're not dealing with one possible cryptid in one area like these could be different places where these things plural actually mm. uh, hide out in um and that even brings us up to you know future expeditions as well which yeah we'll to, but yeah, 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 no, it, I mean, it, it begs it begs so many questions too, right? Like, I mean, if these creatures sort of exist in groups, uh, you know, are are they separate from other groups? And I guess one thing I find always so fascinating is all the different types of these creatures that are reported from from the west coast all the way to the east coast. So keep that in mind when you're trying to like figure out what's really taking place here, because could there really be that many? different types of subspecies of Sasquatch or Bigfoot. I don't know. It's possible. Could they be that well adapted to their environment that they're actually, uh, you know, uh, growing along in that environment different from like how you would at the, in the Pacific Northwest, you know, I'm thinking of the differences of like, you know, you get a lot of reports of the, the skunk ape down in Florida, which is very different from the type of Bigfoot reports you get in the Pacific Northwest. So, um, I don't know. That's something I'm very interested in, too, because, I mean, can there can there be that many Bigfoot species? What's really what's really going on here? Yeah, very good question. Yeah, we're going to talk about one in Pennsylvania a little later that really intrigues me. Uh, mm. But let's I guess let's dive into the evidence this season. Great. Wherever you want to start, Bryce, there are a lot of compelling things throughout the entire season. Um, but if there's anywhere you really want to start where this was like you know, the moment where you're like, oh man, we're really up in the ante this season <laughs> and we're really <laughs> on to right. something. Anything really well, stand out to you from maybe the earlier part of the season? Um, you know, I'm kind of, I'm actually pulling up some of my notes right now, yeah, but you know, do. the first thing, the first thing off of my, the top of my head is just that, you know, I, 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 that shadow creature that was captured, that shadow, whatever that was captured in Washington, um, it, it really had all of our heads spinning. And, uh, and so I'd really like to, to know what that was all about because there are, you know, native legends that do sort of ascribe these qualities to, to the stick man or Bigfoot like type creatures. So that was, we weren't expecting to capture something like that. And then, you know, of, of course for me, 
<laughs> my favorite evidence is always Russell's videos. It's always, you know, I always think it's going to be the vocalizations because I really get a kick out, out of those because like you said, we try to source uh, sounds that come from that area so that we can play them back. And uh, it, it seemed to have worked in the past, but uh, man, that, that, that video that Russell captured in, in California of whatever that was standing up. I mean, I, I'm still sort of, yeah, you're going through some of this there stuff right here. Um, so this video for anyone yeah, again, you can watch the whole so season now on Amazon range. Um, it was I, the weirdest thing ever. Like at first yeah. you're like, okay, maybe it's a bear or something. And yeah. then the thing stands up on two feet and starts walking yeah. up the mountain. It was crazy. Well, and it still could be a bear. Bears are known to like walk on their hind legs, but this, this one just felt different to me. something about my gut was like, it just felt like this creature was possibly observing Russell, which is amazing because he's so far away. And if you'll see in the show, Russell always has some great toys that he brings on his own. I try and provide him as much tech as possible. But let me tell you something. His truck is usually filled to the brim with the coolest gear. Anyway, so he's got this little, this powerful scope where he could record off of his his iPhone. And, and man, you see it right here. And when I first saw this, and I still watch this video and I just kind of go, that's got to be a Bigfoot, right? I mean, unless it's just a bear or, yeah. or something else. But to me, that's that's what we're hunting, man. It's right there. And, and Russell captured it on his video. Yep. Yeah. I mean, again, Russ is willing to sort of go anywhere he can, even places you probably don't want him to go. There was another right. <laughs> moment this season where we almost lost him. I mean, that was yeah. terrifying, man. He's yeah. Well, this is and a tunnel and then boom. That's right. This is sort of your area of expertise uh, covering the UFO and UAP phenomenon. So uh, for your listeners who don't know, we've been doing this the last three years and and we've sort of encountered these balls of light in just about every place we've went. And uh, and it's very strange. And I, for one, am starting to feel that these balls of light are somehow some way connected with the Bigfoot phenomenon. And I, I know I'm probably not the only one to think that, but you know, there has to be a connection. Uh, yeah, to, to uh, reference what you were talking about. Yeah, Russell sees this strange ball of light just sort of, you know, sentiently floating along in the distance. And it and it seems to be leading his way because if you're out there in the field, you're going to look for whatever pops. And so if you see yeah. a strange meandering ball of light, you're going to follow that, you know. And uh, Russell did, and it almost led him off of a hundred foot cliff. So I mean, he's going right through this steel. It must have been a drain pipe or something. He can see the light at the end. And man, he just comes to a dead end uh, sheer drop on a on a face cliff. So, you know, I've spoken with witnesses who say, you know, when you hear a Bigfoot scream or, or, or sound like a woman scream or a baby screaming or you see a strange light, you know, these things are trying to lure you into the woods, into the forest. And it and it does seem to be like that, like that might be what happening here, what's happening here, you know, right. and it brings up a lot of questions to me, you know, for your listeners who aren't following all the, the Bigfoot stuff. There's a whole Bigfoot topic on the bookshelf that discusses sort of missing persons cases and how they might be related to, let's say, a creature like Bigfoot, missing people that 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 go missing in national parks and have very odd circumstances surrounding those disappearances. Is there a connection to Bigfoot? I, I don't know, but it's certainly worth investigating. And, uh, but yeah, so there's something about these things luring you in to the woods and, uh, yeah, pretty interesting. Yeah. 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 I, I think, you know, and we have to keep in mind too, like while you are hunting this, uh, mysterious creature, there are many creatures out there that could be just as dangerous. And we do see that in this season as well. You guys aren't like, it's not like you're telling all the oh, wildlife, man. step back, we're hunting Bigfoot. Like you are oh. in their playground, right? Listen, bears are on my mind. I don't know. For me, it's bears. <laughs> I, I guess, yeah. uh, I think maybe Russell has a thing about mountain lions, something quietly stalking from behind. But yeah, we're out there and look at we're we're pushing into places in the woods where a, a lot of people really don't go. So we're 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 butting up right against uh, wildlife territory and and paths. And so uh, of course we're gonna you know that's always on my mind. I'm not as you know I don't have as much experience in the field as these guys, but. 
I'll tell you one thing. When, when you have a camera behind you, it gives me a sense of courage. I'm like, well, I'm not going to back <laughs> out now. I got to I gotta keep going forward, you know. But there's been some pretty hairy moments on the show. That's for sure. Yeah. Yeah. And even your cameramen have become part of the story a lot mm. of times where, you know, usually these people blend back and into the uh, the background, but they are there with you guys doing this. And I, I give them all the credit in the world. I know there's many on your camera crew and production and I, I, I there's so many people involved with these types of things mm. and they become a part of it as well. I think we we should keep that in mind. Like nobody's safe. Just because there's a camera there doesn't mean, oh, yeah. you know, that that something bad can't happen. So, oh, yeah, again, no, kudos listen, to all and, your entire crew. And not all of them are believers and rightfully so they shouldn't be. But so there's this like thing that happens like when we're, you know, when when something occurs, we kind of look to our like, did you see that? What's that? What do you think that is? Huh? And, and a lot <laughs> of the times they're like, man, I don't fucking know, man. Let me just yeah. get a shot. But uh yeah, no, they've really become a part of the show. And they're they're listen, they're on this journey with us and they're experiencing a lot of these things that we are. So um, they are a hard, let me tell you something. They are a hard working, talented bunch. Uh, shout out to this Expedition Bigfoot crew because they work their asses off and they're just so damn talented. The the show looks that way because of these guys. So I it's important to have a visual experience. I want you to be on your couch and feeling like we're dragging you into the middle of the woods with us. And all you have to do is sit there and eat your popcorn. Yep. Yep. And look at this beautiful scenery. I mean, yeah. some of the drone shots you guys do in this thing are just breathtaking. They, oh, they man. really are brave. It's incredible. Um, let's, I want to go back to this for a moment forgive me. I'm still getting used to this program. There we go. Um, yeah. So this was one of the first things that really caught my attention in the season. And that was these nests. Mm -hmm. And could you maybe describe what these are, what they represent to us, Bryce, and why they were yeah. so important in terms of the expedition this season? Yeah, absolutely. So this thing about Bigfoot nests have sort of become a, a key piece of what we might consider evidence. And, uh, you know, as we said in the show, it's 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 a primate behavior because gorillas actually will make a bed of nest, a nest much like this, only they make a new one every day, which which I was surprised by. But anyway, the camera does not do this and this nest justice. It's hard to see. But when you're there, it looks almost as if Big Bird from Sesame Street made a nest out of the forest pine around you. And that's what it looks like with your eyes, you know? And when you step on it, when I first stepped on it, I almost twisted my ankle because I went so far down. I went on almost like a foot and a half, two feet of just like cushion. And I just stepped right in it and it released this pocket of air that just let out this stench. And so these are like yeah. this idea that these things are, you know, possibly using nests to bed down and just hang out is not a new idea. There's been, um, you know, a project based out of Washington that has been looking into this idea of, of Bigfoot nesting sites for quite some time. And they've got a lot of really compelling evidence. But, um, you know, I was, uh, it's incredible that we were able to find these two. Um, but there's no doubt about it when you see them and, and when and when you smell them, and of course we took eDNA samples, which also um, released some pretty confounding and interesting information as well. Yeah, right. We will definitely get to the DNA tests a little bit later. Um, Great. And it's up to you how much you want to reveal, Bryce. We'll we'll see. But um, let's move on to all right. This was another one that really caught mm. my attention. Yeah. Um, yeah. What what Man. is this? What am I looking at? Man, that is a that looks like a huge footprint to me. And it's about yep. according to the measurements, about 16 and a half, which is right in that wheelhouse of what a of what a big foot footprint should be. But for your audience, lest we forget, this is just a picture of a footprint. But when you put into context of how this shot came to be, you start to understand the story that's taking place. Russell and his cameraman, Zach, were pushing something up the riverbed, uh, choking it out, and they were tracking what they believed was a Bigfoot. They could hear the sounds. They believed they were hot on the trail. Um, they were up on a bridge. When they heard something down below, Zach 
his Russell's cameraman looks over. He thinks he might have saw the tail end of this hairy creature going around the riverbed. So he thinks he got eyes on whatever made this foot track. Russell mm-hmm. rappels down that bridge, which I mean, he does in great time, but uh, obviously enough time for something to get away because you know night nightfall happened. Anyway, he tracked it, and this is the one of the first things he came upon. And uh, uh, yeah, it's just. It's a chef's kiss, Bigfoot print, man. And, uh, you know, we had that analyzed by Dr. Jeffrey Meldrum, um, who took a a pretty good look at it and, and, and and it passed his muster. That's enough for me. That is definitely enough for me. Um, all right. You got to explain this to me, man. This is a discovery you made underwater. Um, what, what was this all about? This is witchy, right? I don't like this. This is just, uh, (laughs) you know, I was investigating a lake where there was a lot of activity. And, uh, you know, of of course, you know, we know we're always going to be near water because if these creatures and everything, you know, survives on water. So we have this incredible submersible drone I was dying to use. I was like, we will use this drone in the lake and we will, (laughs) I don't know. And, you know, a couple, three, four hours later of cruising that thing around and trying to untangle it and get it out of, you know, finally get it moving. You just sort of, you find this thing and you're like, what the heck is that? You know, I mean, it looks, I don't know. It just looks. It it uh, looks made. Like it clearly. It looks made. This was, this is artificial. Um, It looks artificial. I never pulled it out of the lake. (sighs) I never, I never did anything like that, which is, I sort of regret because it'd be great to pull see if i can pull some more evidence off that but to me it just looked very like i don't know you know you run across a lot of these what what's known in the bigfoot community is these these structures the or these ornate tree structures and a lot of the times you know these trees are 14 15 24 inches in diameter they're huge and they're just placed way high in and in these geometric shapes and they crisscross and uh to me they represent some sort of communicative sign i'm not sure what they are saying but they seem to be a way of communicating territory ideas information to other uh passing bigfoot groups or whatever but um i don't know i've seen smaller ones and could this possibly be uh you know something made by a creature like a bigfoot i mean if they're making these big structures who's to say they're not also making you know tiny doll-like structures happens in um you know all over the world in 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 mm-hmm. ancient uh you know people they're always making you know things so i don't know this was but this to me was very witchy i got a bad feeling about <laughs> this whatever the hell it was so <laughs> yeah. yeah yeah i'm gonna stay clear of that one um this is underwater, right. but um Underground bunkers was another thing you guys touched on, which I was not yeah. expecting in a Bigfoot show. Would you mind maybe running us a little through that, Bryce? This um sort of weird secret governmental sure. stuff that you guys looked at this season. Yeah, well, we weren't expecting it either, but we talked to a witness who told us that, you know, he was at a Christmas party where a buddy who was working on some secretive project out west said, you know, hey, man. I check out these. He showed him pictures of these uh, Bigfoots in trees and these research bunkers. And uh, this was in the 70s, by the way. And but that was information that basically said there was obviously some type of funded program, whether it was private or government. I'm not sure, but some type of program invested in researching Bigfoots in the Pacific Northwest and and using hideouts like underground bunkers as command centers. Uh So when you have information like that, it's great information because now with technology today, I can fly a drone over with LIDAR over a certain area and I can look for telltale signs of man-made structures in an area, you know? So this is something that you can check and verify. Um, And that's exactly what we did. And uh, we were able to find some, what looked like anomalous structures that did support that evidence, but Unfortunately, we weren't able to get into them. So, um, so again, it's this blurry line, which I think we're starting to, you know, uncover a little bit more and look at into more is what does the government know about Bigfoot, you know? And, you know, this is a very interesting field where we start to cross because we're at a time and a place for your listeners where 
where now sort of government has had had their hand forced into uh, revealing what their programs that they had and, and their interest in UFO. And now we know, well, of course, the government is interested in UFOs. And of course, they're spending money and earmarking money for these programs. And uh, but the Bigfoot cat is not out of the bag yet. We don't know. We, you know, they've ne their hand hasn't been forced like that New York Times article. You know, uh, the great journalists on that basically had their evidence at hand to say, hey, we're running this story, whether you like it or not. You know, we don't have that in the Bigfoot community yet. But I don't know. I wouldn't be surprised if, you know, five, ten years down the road, uh, you may be seeing the New York Times cover some Bigfoot story. Yeah, yet. That's a good way to put it, man. I think, like you said, it's forcing the hand of the government. They're never going to disclose anything uh, willingly. And it took mm -mm. us decades and decades to finally make that happen with, with UFOs. So I have no doubt there's been government programs. We know for a fact there were some government yeah. um, involvement with Bigfoot and testing uh, hair and whatnot from certain events. And yeah. we're going to go over some of those later that the U.S. Air well, Force looked at during Project Blue Book, of all things. But And just, yeah, I mean, and ju just think about what their interest would be. I mean, a lot of our greatest military technology came from nature. The, the, the skin on a submarine comes from that of a shark. So imagine what you could do if you're, you're hearing rumors about creatures out west that can camouflage and cloak and move silently through areas and, you know, use things like mind speak. And what type of powers of the mind do they have? We know the government is very interested in, in the mind powers of the human being, and they've studied that. Could they be interested in, 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 in powers that these creatures may have? Why not? You know, if we could... If we could pull that and use it for some type of military apparatus, I think that would be great. But let's not put the cart before the horse. First thing we got to do is 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 prove that these creatures do, in fact, exist on a flesh and blood plane. So right. and I think that's going to be a pretty a pretty tough thing to do. It is. But, you know, I mean, you guys are getting closer and closer to discovering if this is flesh and blood or if this is something supernatural or extraterrestrial yeah. you know you we, we will go down that road uh for mm. sure but i think like you said first is proving that these things actually exist and um yeah. I, i'd love to know bryce there were several dna samples that you guys collected this mm. season from different areas and in different ways would you mind maybe running us through uh there were two key i think dna results that you guys uh, revealed in your special, mm -hmm. your post-show yeah. special. Um, could you tell us a little about how these samples were collected and uh, where they went off to be to be reviewed? Yeah, absolutely. So um, the first hair you're probably talking about, the eDNA sample is was pulled from the nesting site. And uh, the eDNA that probably was significant in a strange way was that hair that Russell, Russell made this cool tracker that would you know, and he stuck it on a branch, anything passing by it, uh, you know, he placed it higher than a bear would be. So at like eight, seven foot, anything passing by with hair would grab this tracker. Anyway, we pulled uh, DNA off of that. And, uh, you know, the thing about Bigfoot and, 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 and DNA is it's, is it's sort of a, a long sorted controversial history. So, we're really at, at, at sort of the ground level with eDNA, which stands for environmental DNA. And, uh, and, you know, so we're being very careful with that. And what I mean by that is, so when we were out in Kentucky, we found this strange tree structure. And of course, uh, Dr. Mayer took an eDNA sample and uh, we sent it off to accredited lab here in LA. And it came back showing these pantroglodyte indicators. Pantroglodyte is the species genus name for the chimpanzee. And so it was, it was one of those moments where we were like, wait a minute, what the heck? How is, how is there chimpanzee DNA at this tree structure? I mean, unless there's an escaped chimpanzee right. from a zoo or like what's happening here? Um, you know, we share most of our DNA. The, our closest living relative is that of the orangutan and the chimpanzee. I mean, it's a minuscule difference, uh, the differences between our DNA. But anyway, um, you know, that sent us here. Here's some evidence that's telling us, you know, you're getting some primate hits here. What's going on with that? Um, we actually sent Dr. Mayer back to conduct 
Kentucky because science doesn't work like that. It has to be repeatable. She took right. another sample. Again, that pan troglodyte did come up, but not nearly in the high numbers that it did the first time. So that was a little discouraging. But I guess the hair that you might be talking about was so obviously we pulled EDN, I'm sorry, DNA. Uh, we pulled EDNA samples from those nesting sites. And while we didn't get any, we did get some sort of orang uh, indicators, which is another thing that's like, what? Uh, yeah, but they were very, right there. they were very small. But what we did find uh, was a hair at the nest um, of that uh, on that chain, uh, the chain link fence, and it was that of this species of wolf that is really only found in the Alaskan Panhandle, southeastern Alaska. And so we're like, how the f does that get here in California? Right? It doesn't make any sense whatsoever because it's a yeah. it's it's a very small population of these of these wolves. Um, I forget the name of it. I'm not even going to try it. But uh, but anyway, so I mean, right there, it was kind of like telling us, you know, hey, maybe there's something here because a lot of reports. I'm not a lot of reports. There are a few reports where people do describe these creatures wearing furs whether it's deer pelts whether it's bear uh wolf you know so there there are these reports where people say you know bigfoot wears its kill wears furs it uses its environment sometimes and so i thought why couldn't you know a bigfoot with possibly wearing this uh this strange wolf pelt down here and that's how that hair got there it's, it's the only thing i could think of dr maria wasn't too fancy on that's a pretty big stretch for her but <laughs> but it gave us what we needed to kind of you know move the search north and of course as we revealed on the show um uh, that's all we needed to take it to alaska where there's so many um real interesting reports about about bigfoot so it, it felt very natural <sighs> I can't wait, man. That's like, again, untapped territory. I think one of the members of your team mentioned like such diverse life lives up in Alaska. A lot of things we probably haven't even discovered yet. So I can't even imagine what you guys will uncover there. Yeah. It's crazy. Yeah. Um, imagine, imagine just the acres where human feet have never even tread across. There's got to be just hundreds of thousands of them there in Alaska, you know? Um, it's just the place is huge and and the the lore of bigfoot in, in places like that are so steeped in the culture that it just you know you can walk into a place and people be like bigfoot yeah yeah bigfoot of course you know and you're like oh wow i didn't okay why 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 that you know um so it's a great place and i think it's 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 a natural fit for for our team I love it. Well, you talk about untapped territory. Um, that was another pretty cool and I guess sort of controversial thing this season was um, you guys were tracking something and it ended mm. up on what we now know is federal land, an area that you yeah. guys are not allowed to go investigate. And I've actually run into that problem with investigating UFO cases as well, where mm. there were areas mm -hmm. where I was told that something crashed or a creature had been seen, it might have died, been buried, or maybe debris from a craft was there. And I wanted mm. to go there and dig. And I was told, no, you can't. It's federal land. Sorry about that. Um, yeah. I even worked with a, a gentleman who thought he found stuff at the Roswell site. And they actually mm. confiscated it from him because it is now owned by the government. So well, um, I'd love to maybe hear a little about what you guys dealt with with that, if you don't mind. Well, sure. I mean, what? Think about the perfect bureaucratic red tape. All you would need is to own a small parcel of land to keep anyone off of it, and and of of, of course obtain anything found uh, thereon. You know, here's the thing, and I don't want to be very conspiratorial, you know, because I'm not that I'm not that type of guy. But but um, here's the thing, you know. It seems like there was a lot of Bigfoot activity in this area, and we got information that. When I talked to that logger who had told me he had stumbled upon what could only be described as a Bigfoot nesting site, it was something he had never seen before. He described like almost a dozen beds in this, you know, place uh, that was then uh, 
acquired by some federal land grab, you know, and why, why was that? You know, we were, we were interested in why, why is, a, why the government would be interested in a, in a piece of property like that. So I don't know, it just sent off some red flags for us that like, you know, if obviously I believe if these creatures do in fact exist, they're incredibly intelligent. And uh, like a lot of places that are, that are, you know, cordoned off for wildlife to thrive like Yellowstone, if Bigfoot knows that no hunters, no researchers, no investigators are going to come into this huge parcel of land, why wouldn't they go there, uh, point, you know, yeah. for, for complete protection? Um, so I don't know. It, it's interesting. And yeah, like you said, there, I don't know. There are earmarked budgets for for land acquisition where, where certain crafts have been said to come and land. And I don't know. It's a strange thing. Uh, it but is. Yeah. But it's something <laughs> we're interested in, you know. Cool. Cool. Well, I, yeah, I hope I hope we can further that conversation when it comes to the government's involvement with Bigfoot, for sure. Um, sure. Well, I want to I want to touch on this image. And for those of you listening to the podcast, this mm. is an image of Bryce with it looks like he just got the best Christmas present. Of oh all man time. um oh yeah. would you mind describing what we're seeing here man and kind of the process of uh what's going on in these images here yeah of course so i you know i spoke with a witness who who got a face-to-face -face encounter with a bigfoot that lasted quite a long time and with that comes a lot of memory detail of what this creature looked like so we set him down uh with an incredible forensic sketch artist oh my god his name is uh michael i gotta find it because you should follow him on instagram he does this um his passion is you know drawing sketching these uh, eyewitness accounts of, of bigfoot reports anyway from all that information i was like there's so much here why not just get the skull made you know and that's exactly <laughs> what we did we sent it off to uh to a guy out there and i think it was in scotland i forget but uh his name was tobias uh Dang, I, I wish I don't. I wish I had those names on the tip of my tongue. But anyway, he was able to graft a 3D model of just from that sketch what this Bigfoot head and its proportions would look like. And when you hold it in your hand, you feel like you're holding a piece of our ancestral history in some way, some form. You're like, yes, this this roamed planet Earth or still does. It's a strange feeling, um, and it's huge. And and the and the crazy the picture that you're looking at that's has hair Michael Montoya thank you Bigfoot Society if you're out there <laughs> fight, follow Michael Montoya on Instagram he has an incredible page and uh, you'll just get to see a whole variety of what these Bigfoot creatures um, have been reported to look like but yeah so this one they added hair in the face and it's a little funny at first but when you start peering into the eyes. You sort of then put yourself in the position of what would I do if I was, say, hiking with my son or my daughter or my wife or my dog, and I'm in the middle of nowhere. I'm on a pretty populated trail, and, uh, you know, it's getting dark, and up ahead, something like this walks onto the trail and stops and just stares at you, you know? What would you do? Oh, what would your mind do? Because I, these, I report, tell you, these reports happen all the time. And the people who are reporting them are not looking for fame. They're not looking to make money. Um, as a matter of fact, they're risking more than they're acquiring. They're risking their reputation. Uh, you know, they're they're risking, you know, being laughed at by their friends, family, and peers for being one of those people who saw Bigfoot, but it happens all the time. And, you know, you often hear that when somebody sees a creature like this, if they're a hunter and they see what you're looking at through the scope, they can't pull that trigger because they, they recognize this humanness in these faces. And, and I guess that's, that's a lot of the interest for me in Bigfoot. What is this thing? Is it, is it part of our story? Is it something completely separate from us? Does it represent our past like the small gray alien represents our future? Um, because, you know, there is a very psychological dimension to this thing here too, to this. And that's why I do house it under the, I couch it under the term Bigfoot phenomenon, because yeah. as, as very real as these eyewitness testimonies are of just a flesh and blood creature walking across a trail. I also talked to very credible witnesses who describe these creatures 
dematerializing, um, communicating them with mind speak. Uh, so I call this type of stuff the stranger aspects of Bigfootery. And I don't want to discount it. I don't want to discount it because it's in these small details that I think we're going to get to the bottom of what this mystery really is. And trust me when I say this, th there is a mystery at play here on this planet when it comes to wild, hairy men walking around in the woods. Now, is this a psychological archetype or is there a real unconfirmed uh, relic hominid walking the Pacific Northwest? I don't know, but something is happening. People are seeing something. Evidence is being left behind. And, um, and man, to me, it's just one of the the greatest mysteries at our dinner plate. And, and, and to me, that's why I just, I just love this so much is because ever since I saw that Patterson Gimlin films film, I, I've always felt like I was looking at the monster under my bed that my parents told me wasn't supposed to be there, but yet there it is walking off into the woods. What is that? I love that, man. Yeah. I've had those moments too of, looking in the sky and seeing something I couldn't readily explain and being like, I was told this wasn't a thing. Mm. This wasn't real. And, but I'm looking at it. So like someone's either lying to me or mm. uh, the world is far stranger than I could have ever imagined. And everyone in the chat here saying preach, preach Bryce, this idea of um, <laughs> the Bigfoot being our past and the alien being our future. And we're somehow yeah. converging right now. And maybe it's, try finally understanding that timeline. Um, well, it, oh, yeah, man, it's, that it's, just it, blows it, my mind to think about that. Sure, it's something I'm fascinated with because you know, look, there does seem to be a psychological dimension to this. We do seem to be pulling this image. We can't seem to let go of of where we came from. You know, uh, uh, traveling around and hunter gather small groups, uh, stronger, bigger, taller hunter gather you know private shy intelligent um not ready to enter the blubbering life of a city dweller you know staying in the woods you know there is that image of us we're fascinated by it it's where we come from and then you have the small gray alien archetype that's been developing in the ufo community what's that why the big brain why the small mouth why the spindly arms does it not need to eat as much? Does it have more brain computing power? Has it already interfaced with AI? You know, is that our future? Are we pulling that ar archetype towards us? You know, mm -hmm. um, these are questions we all should be asking because it's like that great moment in Star Wars when Luke Skywalker, when he's training with Yoda and he's going into the woods and he says, you're only going to find what you bring with you. You know, and I think that happens yeah. a lot in the UFO community and the Bigfoot community. We find what we bring with us and the phenomenon can morph and change into whatever it needs to, to represent itself to us. So uh, it's a strange thing. Absolutely. I think, you know, one of the words that always, always stands out to me with these phenomena is amorphous. It really mm -hmm. does bend and mold to what we either want it to be or maybe not want it to be and um, yeah. what you can take uh what your perception can manage and it's yeah. it's fascinating someone in the chat said very Jungian stuff i, I hope yeah. that's a good thing i hope that's a it good absolutely thing. Um, is absolutely <laughs> well i want to touch on bryce um there was also a part in this season where you guys did go back to the patterson gimlin film am yes. i correct in that and look yes. at that someone in the chat absolutely. said um, didn't they yeah. admit that it was faked? Uh, is that true? And if not, no. can you tell us a little about what you guys looked at this season with that? Sure, absolutely. Look, okay. there's been a lot of things said about the Patterson Gimlin video and the film site, but first and foremost, I want to give my utmost gratitude and shout out to what is the Bluff Creek Project and guys like Rowdy Kelly and even Tate, who without them, we would have never gotten down there to the exact place and been able to pinpoint a lot of those uh, sort of precise markers that we use. So uh, a big shout out to those guys who have been, who've been doing that hard work for so, so long. This video, the 1967 Patterson Gimlin video is more than just a video and it'll never be more than just a film. It'll never be proved. Okay. And it'll never be validated or vindicated. And it'll also never be, um, proven to be a hoax. It can't, 
it's it's done. It's lost in time. It's already been mythologized. It's moved past that. It's on into the world of of Tulpa now. The Patterson Gimlin film is an incredible piece of evidence, and people have been looking at that film for more than fifty years. I believe it could be the most second analyzed film behind the Zabruder film, uh, where JFK mm -hmm. was shot. Um, so anyway, people have been trying to figure out how tall that subject that creature was in the film for decades because they've always felt if we could get a height on that creature, we could prove once and for all that that's a Bigfoot. And, you know, I sort of thought that too, but when we had the technology to use LIDAR um, on a site like that, it's an incredible opportunity because not only be, you know, can you determine the pebbles on the ground up to the leaves on the tree you can determine anything you need to. And so it was, I'm really proud of, of the work we did there. So anyway, we were able to LIDAR that site and make a determination once and for all uh, that anybody can check the data, how tall that creature was. Her name is Patty. They call her that because uh, that was Roger Patterson's name, wife's name, but also because Roger Patterson, they called it Patty. Anyway, I'm rambling. I'm I'm going on and on. The creature came out to be six foot three, but that doesn't matter because we also know it to be a female. And in the gorilla population, the males are usually on average 20 to 25 percent larger than their female counterparts. So that puts Patty right in that that perfect zone of, of what a female Bigfoot might look like. And here's another thing. What I've, I'll have just say this about the Patterson-Gimlin film. I know a lot of people uh, say, yeah, but isn't that guy, he went on that show and he did the lie detector test about the, about he's the guy that wore the suit. Yeah, he may have did that. And those producers, have you ever seen anybody win on that said show? <laughs> No, no, because it was formulated that way. And if you look into it, you're really only knowing half the story. Roger Patterson also took a lie detector test on his deathbed, too, and came back that he was telling the truth, too. So they can't both be telling the truth. Anyway, um, it's just an incredible piece of evidence because you had two witnesses describing the same thing. They've never changed their story over 50 years. You have that incredible film left behind. And you also have the trackway cast that they also took. So they were able to plaster cast those tracks that that creature left behind. And, and uh, I don't know if you, if your audience had seen uh, the show, but I speak with uh, PGF film expert, Bill Munns. And when you watch him walk, you walk you through that video and you see the toes going up and down like this yeah. and the calf muscle moving and the hair on the back of its neck rising as it turns around to catch Bob Gimlin about to point its rifle at her, you know, as then he said it, I don't know what that is. I just know it's a hundred percent biological organic. That is not a suit. And I agree with him 100%. That's so cool. Yeah, that is not a suit. And, you know, I think that's what's so cool, Bryce, about today's world of investigation is we have this in the UFO field too, where we can now go look at literally cases from antiquity mm -hmm. and look at them in a different light. Um, we have people in the UFO field now who are going back to um, cases in the, uh, you know, the 1700s, the 1800s, and they're able to geographically, you know, find these places on Google Maps. They're able to go back and find what the weather was at that time mm. and be like, huh, maybe this was a weather phenomenon. So the yeah. fact that now we can actually use tools to go back and solve past cases I think is uh, incredible. I mean, will we ever truly know what Patterson Gimlin was? Maybe not. Maybe not what Roswell was or, you know, all these other UFO cases. But we have a chance. We now have better mm. chances at unraveling these things, which I think is so cool. And an example of that is what you guys did on the show. Well, thank you. I, I completely agree. You know, I also do a, another podcast. It's called the Bigfoot Collectors Club. And and we've been researching stories of high strangeness for the last five years. And, and, and one thing I've come to learn is that is to look for that strange detail. Don't discount it because it doesn't fit what you think defines a UFO encounter or an abduction story or a Bigfoot encounter. Look for that strange detail because that's going to hold a clue. Because when you start to look at a lot of these cases, cryptozoological, ufological, UFOs, cryptids, whatever, you name it, 
there's a, just about a strange detail in each and every one of those cases, and they start to form patterns. And you can start to see an overall picture that there is a good chance that perhaps a lot of this phenomenon is connected. Um, I don't know. It's a crazy theory, but but don't discount the strange. Look for the strange. Look for the strange. Well, hey, you guys definitely did that this season for sure. And um, the next image I'm going to put up here is going to show that you definitely were willing to look at other uh, possibilities. There's my ugly mug oh, there on <laughs> yes. Expedition Bigfoot. I should mention, yes. you know, I'm a little biased when it comes to liking the show because I was so graciously invited on by you um, to talk about the connections between Bigfoot and UFOs, something people do not think about. And uh, when you came to me, man, I was like racking my brain. I'm like, I know they're out there. I know they're mm -hmm, out there. So mm -hmm. I started digging digging, digging. And I was able to find some pretty compelling stuff to show that at least Bigfoot was being sighted with UFOs. Now, does that necessarily mean they're connected? We don't know. But um, there were some fascinating cases. So I guess, what did your other teammates think when you brought this idea to them? I know people like um, like Ronnie had seen stuff when he was out in the field. You yeah. saw lights. All of yeah. your team members saw weird lights out there. Um, yeah. What did they think when you said, I'm bringing a ufologist in to talk about this? Were they like, oh, God, here we go. This is where the <laughs> this is where we jump the shark. <laughs> <laughs> well, and, and you know, this is this is what I, I I love because this is your lane. And I'm sure they probably thought, hey, we've got enough to chew on with this Bigfoot thing. But I want yeah. people to know. I want people to know that, and Ryan, you did this so perfectly. You just laid the groundwork for how all this stuff is connected. And, you know, we've been interested in, in, in stuff like, you know, uh, I'll start here. You know, we talked a little bit about Skinwalker Ranch on your segment and, and, and why that's important and, uh, and what that has to do with Bigfoot, right? What does that have to do with Bigfoot? And the truth is, the truth is, is once we, read books like Skinwalkers at the Pentagon by George Knapp. And we read into where that $22 million of the defense budget that was allocated for a tip, uh, mm -hmm. you know, this UFO program, where'd all that money go? Well, we now know it went to a place called Skinwalker Ranch where they were looking into all sorts of phenomenons like UFOs, UAPs, upright walking creatures, big hairy monsters, as John Keel used to call them. So we know that millions of dollars were spent at this ranch and they were collecting data on all kinds of strange shit. Uh, pardon my French. So, you no, know, when you're, so, you know, when you're trying to make these connections, it, it, it's, it's not hard to do because, I mean, it is hard to do because each field is so, you know, gussied up with controversy, but, but it's easy to point to those markers at like, places like Skinwalker and say, you know, the government is interested in places like this and phenomenon like this. Mm -hmm. Right. And, you know, I, this, this dates back a long time. I mean, you can look at something like, um, one of the cases I brought up with you guys out of California, not too mm. far from where you were actually investigating Bigfoot. Um, there was a case in Humboldt County in 1888, uh, where this cattle rancher, was approached by Native Americans, and they said, come with us. We have to show you something. Come with us, white man. We have to show you something. And they bring him to this cave, and there they have this creature that's just in the cave, sort of scared, doesn't know what it's doing. And they're like, do you know what this is? Because we don't. Um, but we saw it come from a moon that descended to the ground. Three of these mm. creatures came out and they started scampering all over. One of them came into the cave and it won't leave now. And they look at this thing. It's got black hair, yellow eyes, and it's just, it, it, it seems terrified. It doesn't know what to do. And um, this is one of the earliest cases I was able to find where we had a moon or let's say a UFO descend from the sky, bring out these creatures, and then presumably pick them back up. I don't know, but yeah. What did you think when, um, when we, when we saw that this doesn't just, you know, this isn't a modern UFO era thing. This, these things have been right. happening for a while. Right. You know, I'm not too surprised to find out there's some old, uh, 
you know, indigenous legends of, of, of tall, hairy creatures and strange lights in the sky. It's hard. And your UFO audience must know when somebody's describing a small descending moon, we're talking about a UFO here, right? I mean, what are we talking about here? So, so yeah, I, I, I love that connection and, and, and that's a great story. And, and uh, yeah, I'm not sure what the connection is there. There does seem to be one. I, I'm not sure what the relationship with the UFO UAP phenomenon and Bigfoot is. Maybe, maybe if there are intelligent pilots of these craft, they are aware of all the different flora and fauna that exist on this planet that might include a creature like Bigfoot. And they're interested in checking up on him as well. I know they're interested in checking up on us. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. Um, well, this is these are some people who they might have checked up on. I don't know if yeah. I brought this up on the show, Bryce. Are oh, you familiar man. with the Dyatlov Pass incident? Come on, man. Is Bryce Johnson you're talking to? I'm almost I, I uh, okay. Uh, yeah, of course, man. I actually <laughs> i i did a uh, i did a show that might be coming out soon where I'll I'll, I'll serve as a talking head expert on the Dyatlov Pass case. So I'm oh very gosh. familiar. Perfect. With, to this, be, with, to be. With, with the incredible story of these nine hikers and 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 how they all lost their lives and it and was that picture tragic. right there that to me looks like what might be considered a russian mank or a bigfoot yep. russian style yeah. so you know i did an episode <laughs> yeah exactly i did an episode a while back on diet love and we did go over the many theories about what could have happened to these to these hikers you know everything mm. from obviously possible missile tests being done or a very unruly um native tribe that didn't want these people there yeah. up to ufos and and possible cryptid creatures you know this I'll, is the, I'll, I'll, I'll i'll say yeah. this about the dietlov pass if if you if you start to research the case and go over all the injuries sustained uh pre and post death and you look at everybody's possible scenarios, there's really only one candidate, in my humble opinion, that fits the bill that could accomplish all these, you know, uh, terrible injuries. And that's a, a Bigfoot. I don't I don't believe in the mini avalanche theory. I don't believe in radiation coming off of a missile test. I don't believe in in Russian military getting involved, because if somebody's going to point a gun at you, you're going to fight for your life, right? You're not going to let them yeah. crush your ribs, take out your eyes, eat your tongue. You're going to fight back. No bullet shots were fired. Uh, these nine hikers were huddled inside their tent. Experts found that a, a knife was cut from inside the tent, inside. that. To me, that looks like trying to peer out from the safety right. of your tent. And then everybody just scattered to their own death and would die of... Uh, uh, brutal, brutal injuries. Brutal, brutal. Uh, yeah. And, uh, you know, I think the coroner described it. It was almost as if these injuries were sustained by like somebody hugging someone to death, you know? So uh, I don't know, man, it's a strange case, but I, I, I do believe people dismiss the, uh, the Russian Bigfoot a little, a little early, a little preemptive. I still think it's a good candidate for what might've happened to those nine hikers. I have to agree. And we have to say these photos were found on the cameras of some of the mm. individuals. You've got what could be considered a UFO, possibly, uh, mm -hmm. or this could be an artifact within the camera. We just don't know. There were mm. ve many very mysterious photos that were found. And this supposed creature that we're looking at was one of those as well. Could it be a hiker dressed up? Maybe. Could it just mm. be you know, it could be anything, but the fact of the matter is anything. these nine people were brutally, brutally killed. And you yeah. truly do have to wonder what happened there. Um, so I always well, go to it, that one as well. Yeah. Yeah. Me too. I mean, in, in one of the ladies journals, she said, I believe her name was Lude Miller. She wrote down the snowman exists. That's what they call the Russian Bigfoot, the snowman. <laughs> Why would she write that? That gives me chills. I was just thinking about it. Um, someone in the chat here, actually brought this up um godly moose says the 73 wave is infamous of ufos and mm. bigfoot um so this is another big case that i looked into um in fayette county pennsylvania where uh George, oh is this the yeah this is the um the stan the, the gordon one stuff where, right yes yes yep stan mm. gordon the famous ufo investigator investigated this where um george kowalsik i want to get his name more kowalsik um this dude witnesses this red ball come out of the sky and basically crash land in a field. And so he pulls over George to go look at what this was. 
And when he gets out of his car, you know, he's <laughs> gun in hand, ready to see what the heck's going on. And what does he see? But these hairy hominid creatures come out of the light of this ball that landed it there. Deep red eyes, as you can see there. And they start walking towards him and he's just not having it. He's terrified. Yeah. So he, he fires at these things, dude. And the bullets supposedly just start, you know, ricocheting off of them. It's not, not affecting them. However, it does seem to scare them and they just turn around very slowly and walk back to their craft. And um, again, like what the hell is going on here? So he reports this to the local law enforcement and the next day they go out there to investigate the area and what do they find? They find all these burnt char marks on the fence posts. Mm. They see this huge indentation in the ground where it looks like something landed. Um, there were, there was like a sulfuric smell all around the area as well that George said he could smell when these creatures came out. And I know you Classic. guys have experienced these phantom smells as well. Of um, These creatures don't seem to uh, shower that often. And yeah. uh, something, something's going on there. But this is another striking case of UFOs in Bigfoot. What do you make of this one? I would say if those pictures are cool, anybody who saw that and tried to describe it and report it, a sheriff taking the report would say, you mean Bigfoot? So, yeah, I mean, yeah. that looks like a Bigfoot to me, right? Maybe not your typical Bigfoot. But what's interesting is, yeah, I'm, I, I, I love this case. Comes out of an orange fiery ball, strange, doesn't know where it is, acting crazy. Laser eyes. Who doesn't love a Bigfoot with laser eyes? And uh, <laughs> yeah, it's strange, exactly. right? You know, uh, one of my favorite uh, sort of, I guess, authors is a guy named John Keel. He was a Fortean investigator and uh, he wrote the Mothman prophecies. He's sort of famous for, yep. for that. But uh, he called all these things BHMs, otherwise known as big, hairy monsters. And uh <laughs> And he didn't want to like, you know, get specific because like this creature that you just pointed out to us, there were so many different colors and variations and sizes and looks that he just started labeling them all big hairy monsters. And, you know, maybe it's the same type of phenomenon that people are experiencing out in the in the woods, you know, I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. Same. Um, I do want to thank Mark here for a super sticker. Thanks, man. Mark's a big supporter of. Thank Somewhere you, Mark. Yes. So we always appreciate that. Yeah, guys, if you want, um, throw some questions in the super chat. If you want to help out the show, support somewhere in the skies, we'll have Bryce hopefully have some answers for you. Um, he is a busy guy, so we probably won't be going for too much longer. But uh, Bryce, I've got one more case that I wanted okay. to bring up with you, if that's cool. And this actually sure. comes from uh, the actual Project Blue Book files. Mm. And this is one I brought to the show because I was like, here you go. Here is when the government or the U.S. Air Force actually had files on a Bigfoot case that involved UFOs. And this one actually happened. This was case number 10798 of the Project Blue oh. Book files. Um, and this happened in July of 1966 in Presque Isle State Park in Pennsylvania. Again, there's something with Pennsylvania, man, yeah. um, where all these things are happening. Um, these, these four tourists from New York were on vacation and they went to the beach and their car actually got stuck in the sand. So it was two women, two guys, the guys go to look for help, someone to help them get the car out. And meanwhile, they see some weird thing in the sky, like just zip past the water. They thought maybe it was a plane coming in for like an emergency landing, but whatever these lights were, they went into the woods, disappeared. So the guys are like, oh, crap. All right, now we have a bigger problem. We have to go see if this is like a crash plane or something. So they go and look in the woods, and they can't find anything. Um, there's mm. nothing there that would say that, um, you know, something had crashed. While this is happening, the women are still in the car. And what they claim is that some sort of hairy creature, at least seven feet tall, started running towards them on the beach jumped on the top of their car, shook the car, and then got off and ran into the woods where that UFO supposedly went. And then they the guys come back and they're like, we didn't find anything. Um, we're going to go try to find the police. And they're like, we've got bigger problems. Like uh, Bigfoot or something just attacked us. So God. Like, all right. All right. So they go to local law enforcement and um, they come in. And the police are definitely saying something's weird here. Like there's huge 
indentations on the top of the roof. Um, there were reports in the area of something in the sky around Presque Isle. So something weird was happening. So what did they do? They phone air, the Air Force. They phone Project Blue Book. And several Air Force investigators, one of which you see in this photo here, actually showed up and took a report. He's looking at the indentations right there in the beach. And uh, this is the official file. And I know it's a little small. I don't know if I can make it any bigger, but mm. you can see on the um, the right hand side there, the conclusions, lights, unidentified, um, indentations, not related to above sighting. Okay, maybe, maybe not. the last one. <laughs> monster <laughs> probable animal not related so we don't know oh, i just think it's yeah. hilarious um, in a project blue book file it says yeah monster. they give the ufo it's justice they're like unidentified and then even the second one they're like uh unidentified and then they're like third one for bigfoot probably animal probably yeah. animal everything else though ufos <laughs> but that was yeah. probably an animal like come on probably man, an animal. <laughs> uh, man. <laughs> that's great and i know man. i never i love that one yeah it's great. It's great. And I know there's other cases as well, um, uh, but those were the ones I were I was able to dig up for Expedition Bigfoot. So um, I highly suggest people watch the special you guys did called New Discoveries, um, where we get the results from the tests that you guys did as well. Mm -hmm. And um, a lot of stuff, including one I didn't mention. So before we go, Bryce, and maybe if there's any listener questions, uh, tell me about this remote viewing thing. Please, oh yeah please um, we didn't even oh, yeah. touch on that i totally forgot you guys had oh, a remote yeah. viewer come in how did this come about well i'm always trying to think of uh sort of you know um outside of the box ways to hunt bigfoot right and what yeah. better way than get a remote viewer to tell us right where bigfoot's hiding for those uh in your show who aren't familiar with remote viewing it was uh it's this idea that given just a small amount of information, an individual can uh, get a picture of in their mind this place or a, a place or an object, and they can do it and they can draw it out and give you that information. And the government was very interested and still are in this in this subject of remote viewing, and they studied it extensively at uh, labs like SRI in the 70s. Uh, there's some great research materials on remote viewing. You should check it out. But anyway, so this guy named Chris Duncan, he tells us, you know, he does a reading for Ronnie and and he gets a lot of things like, you know, this fence, he saw a fence and, and next close to these nests that we found was this fence. And so, you know, he's just starting to get hit after hit after hit so much so that we're like, holy cow, this guy is like just insane good right yeah. like he's hitting on everything we had him on the post show you saw him but what you didn't see was i think maria and rightfully so was still a little skeptical about this idea of remote viewing and she's like can you do one for me now and chris duncan was like yeah sure sure i <laughs> you know i don't have uh my tools they really only need a pencil and a piece of paper but um so he's like yeah and so he did this spontaneous remote viewing thing for Maria. He had Maria sort of pick a place in her mind and, uh, and then give him a little bit of information ab about it. Just like, I, I forgot how it went down. Um, maybe it was like, tell me one thing about it. Anyway, he start he, mm -hmm. he finally gets it and he starts to go into detail. Okay. I've got it. I'm in a, I'm in a tunnel. I see water, like a, like a waterfall and Maria, Maria's face just goes, she goes, I'm thinking of this place I used to go to when I was a kid where it had a tunnel and a waterfall <laughs> behind the tunnel. She was fucking blown away. Pardon my French. Wow, but there's something to that remote viewing. Um, so, uh, but I thought that was really interesting. I wish that would have made the cut because that would have even turned the most hardened skeptic into like, oh my God. So, uh, <laughs> well, do me a favor. Cool go post edit take me out and please put that in because that's no a lot more oh my god <laughs> ryan you were so great and you were so and and you know what it was such an integral part of this conversation is because now we can sort of marry the two together and and have a, a civilized discussion about ufos and this wild hairy man of the woods and what's their connection to each other yeah yeah, well, I appreciate that, man. And I have to tell you, um, your audience for your show is are so nice. I can't tell you. After mm. that aired, I had hundreds of people reach out to me, whether on Twitter oh, or that's great. email, Facebook. 
um, saying, hey, we saw you on Expedition Bigfoot. We're like, we want to learn more about these possible connections. Oh, and that's it great. was it it meant the world to me, man. Because again, like as a UFO person coming into the Bigfoot world, I'm a little intimidated. I don't want to yeah. muddy the waters, as they say, and make things harder. Um, but you can't deny when you have a Project Blue Book file, say monster, and that these things were sighted, um, yeah. you can't just brush that off. It's part of the data. It's part of the scientific method to look at everything before you get rid of anything. Yeah. So um, I have to say thank you to your audience for being so accepting of these theories. That might have something to do with it, but might not. But hey, let's at least take a look at it. That's that. At least that's my opinion. Hey man, appreciate that. Yeah, they're they're really great fans, and and so are your somewhere in the skies listeners. And I think our fans all have something in common, man. We just we just want some answers, and uh, and and you know we're we're willing to think outside the box and 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 put our money where our mouth is and 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 try and get some of these answers. So we we know what type of weird world we are living in, man. Because <laughs> exactly. reality is so strange. There's got to be something to it, man. Just getting weirder and weirder. Um, yeah, and I well, love Bryce, it. I've got just a, a couple listener questions. If you can stick sure. around, sure, you gotta yeah. go, man. I totally okay, cool. Yeah, let's take Our a first couple. one. Sure, awesome. Rick Roberts, thank you so much for the super chat, man. Any plans on leaving more trap cameras or live cams around? You guys got any sort of 24 yeah. hour monitoring going on or? Yeah, we've yeah, tried that. We did that? some of the 24 hour monitoring thing. We caught something really great in our first year. That was pretty interesting. Um, uh, yeah, I love, I love, uh, camera traps and, uh, un unfortunately, man, if you go through, I mean, think about all the hunters using camera traps all over the world. They seem yeah. to. They seem to, okay, here's my theory on camera traps, right? When you're entering into a space where, where there might potentially be a Bigfoot, they know you're in that space before you know you're in that space. In other words, they can smell you. They hear you coming. They, they're they watching you put up this trail camera on some tree and maybe snickering going, yeah, dude, you're not, I'm not going to, maybe I'll, <laughs> maybe I'll knock that tree down. Maybe I'll take your camera, but I'm not going to. I don't want my yeah. selfie taken today. There's not a lot of great trail camera Bigfoot photos, and there should be, right? So something's going on there. There's a couple of them, and uh, we've even caught a couple of uh, some pretty strange uh, photos. But, you know, there was an interesting study done with primates and uh, new objects placed into their environment, and they all became very aware and very suspicious of the new object. Uh, so perhaps that translates into the field. Like, you know, when something like a trail camera is being put on a tree, right. um, you know, they're going to know about it, you know? Yeah. They're a lot smarter than I think we give them credit for. Absolutely. Mm. That's a good point. Um, Darcy's here. She asks Bryce, what way tech experiment do you want to still try during an investigation that you have not gotten a chance to yet? Any mm. big bucket list things you want to do? Oh man, I have a lot of crazy ideas. Believe you me, I do. And uh, you know, I was just gonna say one more thing on that trail camera thing. You you put, yeah, yeah. you touched on this earlier. You know, think about how we as humans take in our environment, our our spectrum of senses. You know, we only see such a small spectrum on the audio and visual spectrum. What if these Bigfoot creatures have the ability to sort of sense electromagnetic? electromagnetic activity coming from a device perhaps they see in a spectrum that a trail camera sticks out like a sore thumb in their trees yeah. you know um but anyway what type of tech uh, experiment do i want to try uh that i haven't gotten to 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 change yeah, what that i want i want to summon a bigfoot <laughs> <laughs> using uh, uh, some type of magical ritual. Maybe I'll get a hold of uh, Greg and Dana uh, Newkirk and have them help me. But I'm in, yeah. I want to try some crazy stuff. You know, detectives, when, when they're really stymied on a missing person's case, there's been times where they've looked to a psychic to help them for a clue or to look in different areas. With the success that we had of, with the remote viewing, I wouldn't be I wouldn't mind trying like a, a really talented psychic and seeing she can point us in the right direction or something like that. Um, mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, I don't know. I've got a lot of I've got a whole notebook a full of crazy ways on how to <laughs> capture evidence of Bigfoot. <laughs> so, oh, my God. Uh, I would kill to see that notebook. Kill to see that. <laughs> it That's reads like awesome, a comic man. book sometimes. Yeah. <laughs> Which your life is slowly becoming. It's it's. I so know cool. it's too so weird. Cool. 
<laughs> uh, Logan Black says, what's your favorite UFO hotspot in the world? Any area that you, mm. um, you'd like to go out as a budding ufologist now? You're in, man. You had me on the yeah. show. You're, you're, yeah. making, you're putting those questions out there. Yeah, where do you want to go to look for UFOs? Well, I'd want to go to a place that would give me the best chance of seeing one. And, you know, I had a guy named Jim Perry who runs the Euphemet podcast. Uh, right. Great guy. He was a guest on our, our podcast. And he talked about a place called Sea City Ranch, where there seems to be a lot of UFO activity. And not only that, he had a Bigfoot experience there as well. So there seems to be a, a, a crossover of the two phenomenons taking place in this one little place called the Sea City Ranch. I believe it's in Northern California, somewhere around I, here, but I, I might try it there right. first. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but I would go there either that, or I would go to maybe a place like Sedona or something and go into an energy <laughs> portal and see what I could love see. it. Just see Bryce meditating. He's got the crystals on that is Sedona <laughs> to a T or Joshua tree. You know, yeah. Insert yeah. Metaphysical place here. That's for sure. Um, mine would be, I, I don't even think this person wants my opinion, but, um, <laughs> mine would be the San Luis Valley. Actually, oh, that wow, place yeah. is crazy. Cattle mutilation, shadow figures. Oh Bigfoot. yeah. You have, it's like the skinwalker ranch, I think of, uh, Colorado. Um, yeah. so that's where I would want to go. I think that's the mm. next big place that people are sort of looking at, um, besides skinwalker ranch or you know, these other sort of what they call window areas that yeah. we talked about on the special there where all of these weird things seem to be happening. Um, what do you think that is, man? Skinwalker Ranch. You did mention that at the top of the show. Do you yeah. think there are actual areas where all of this stuff converges or, um, yeah, yeah. What do you uh, think? I, I, you know, it's, it's such a great question. I really got interested in the, in the skinwalker thing when George Knapp and Comb Kelleher first originally wrote their book, but you know, you turned me on to George's new book, Skinwalkers at the Pentagon, and there he sort of lays out this idea and concept of the hitchhiker, which is like when you go to a place like Skinwalker, be careful because you could be bringing something back home. A few of these military analysts and experts that visited the ranch early on, when they went back home, do you know what they brought back with them? Yeah. Dogmen that would come in their backyard dogmen so like these wolf type creatures uh would end up in their homes in their backyard and this didn't happen once twice but uh half a dozen or so times to different people on that ranch so when you start talking about this dogman phenomena that is relatively recent in the annals of cryptozoology i start to wonder what's going on here why is this new and why is 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 the big man is bigfoot archetype changing into more like lichen more wolf like because we're getting a lot of credible dog men reports in and around the country and i find those very strange especially at places like skinwalker ranch right and lest we forget you guys possibly found hair from some wolf like creature in northern california of all places that shouldn't be there so like again <laughs> Are we dealing right. what with if that's a, one of what a, yeah. phenomenon? What if that's one of those hairs that like on Russell's tracker, it comes back human, but it's not really human. What if this hair comes back like Alaskan wolf, but it's not really Alaskan wolf. Maybe it's more right. of a this. I don't know. I don't know. My fans would be like, no, stay on Bigfoot. <laughs> don't <laughs> don't go to dog man yet. Stay I'm like, on okay, target. okay. <laughs> Let me just stay on Bigfoot right now. <laughs> I love it. I love it, man. Well, hey, I've kept you much longer than I told you. So we're going to wrap things up here, my man. But um, before cool. we go, um, please, can you tell us a little about what comes next for you guys? Um, and then, yeah, tell us about the podcast and everything else you got going on. Um, this yeah, is the time. Give us all of great. the Bigfoot, uh, Bigfoot stuff coming up. Absolutely. Well, as we revealed on, on the post show that, that of course, Ryan was on, we follow this new lead from that, uh, from the DNA results from this wolf hair, and it takes us to Alaska. And we had a, the most incredible journey in Alaska. I can't wait for our fans to, to witness and explore that with us. And, uh, and you can find every episode of Expedition ever made on the Discovery Plus app. Please do. It's the home of paranormal television. There is... I mean, Travel Channel is is the home for paranormal television, and you can get that 
all on the Discovery Plus app. Uh, and then other than that, I do a, a podcast with my great buddy, Michael McMillan and Riley Bray. It's called the Bigfoot Collectors Club. Ryan's been a part of it. Come check out his episode if you're looking for a great starter episode to check us out. We talk to amazing guests about their personal paranormal history, and then we tell a story of high strangeness. We don't take ourselves too seriously, but we take the subject of the strange very seriously uh, wherever you get your podcasts. Yep, wherever you get somewhere in the skies, you can find it. I had the amazing opportunity to be your understudy recently because you were out hunting Bigfoot. Oh, yes. <laughs> and That's Michael right. called me in, man, called me in from the bullpen, and he was like, That's I great. need you. We got to talk UFO that. congressional hearings. So I got to so beat Bryce good. Johnson for an That's episode. Great. It was so I much love fun. That, man. Well, we think the world so, of so you and fun. we think the world of your audience. So thank you for all that you do, man. You're you're at the perfect time and the place to be uh, delivering out that good, good UFO podcast stuff. So thank <laughs> you for what you do. Thanks, man. And thank you again for coming on Somewhere in the Skies. It truly was an honor. Anytime, man. It's my pleasure. Awesome. I'm going to talk some shop with the audience here, man, but I'm going to let you go. Get back to work. I know the work is only beginning over there at Expedition Bigfoot. So have a great night and please give Michael and, uh, and Riley my best. Cool. Thank you so much. Thank you guys. Take care. Bye. Oh my gosh, guys. That was so much fun. Again, I knew having Bryce on that this conversation would just go into a million different places and it did it truly did and um i loved it so please let us know what you think in the comments below um is there a connection between bigfoot and ufos i seem to think there is i think bryce is kind of on his way there as well um but we'll see we'll see in future expeditions with expedition bigfoot uh again you can check it out on discovery plus right now um you can also get that through amazon prime i believe is where i watched it and it's fantastic so uh with that guys Please, um, we check out the show. We did another episode uh, today that dropped today, actually, where we talked to um, uh, we talked to Tim Barnes. He is a Comedy Central animation animation creator. He has a new series on Comedy Central called uh, what is it called? Maurice on Mars, and uh, hilarious, hilarious. You can check it out on the YouTube channel of Comedy Central, and uh, it's all about. Earthlings going to colonize Mars and bringing all of the baggage from Earth with them. It's really funny. I highly suggest you check out our interview with Tim Barnes and go check out the cartoon as well. Um, other than that, we've got some awesome episodes coming up in the near future. Another Witness Accounts episode where you call in and tell me your UFO stories in your own words. I don't interrupt. I don't get involved. This is just you telling your story and the more stories we hear the more normal this becomes and that's when we can truly get to the heart of these mysteries uh one experience at a time so yeah if you have had a ufo incident sighting encounter that you want to share on the show please feel free to reach out to me you can use the contact tab on our website somewhere in the skies.com uh there's links right down there in the show notes for you as well and yeah, we got a lot coming up, guys. Buckle up. Things are going to be a little crazy in these next few months as I plan to move overseas. But um, the show will continue. Nothing will change here at Somewhere in the Skies. This is my life. This is my passion. I love every second of it. Doesn't matter where I'm located. I will continue to uh, prod these mysteries as long as I possibly can until we find some answers. So yeah. That's about it, guys. Um, thank you for joining us tonight. My special thanks to Bryce Johnson for coming on. And um, with that, you can check out the show every Monday, wherever you get podcasts. We're on Twitter, at Summer Skies. Instagram, at Summer Skies Pod. And if you like this episode, please share it with your friends and family. Click like, click subscribe. You'll be the first to know when we release new episodes. So that's it, guys. I will leave you with our slogan, as always, here. And that is to keep your feet on the ground, but never stop searching somewhere in the skies. Have a great night. Hey guys, Ryan here. The Somewhere in the Skies podcast is a labor of love every week. And with that comes many different costs to keep the show running. That's where our Patreon campaign comes in. You give what you think the show is worth. There's different rewards available all the time, including shoutouts on the show, early editions of main episodes, bonus episodes and content, and very soon, monthly patron hangouts, where we sit back and chat all things UFOs. 
so I hope you'll consider becoming a Patreon subscriber today. To learn more and to join, visit patreon.com slash somewhere skies. Thank you for your support and keep looking up.